Today's scripture reading is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 to 9. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and the extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God, also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that through he, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Stella. Good morning, and welcome again to Redeemer Lincoln Square. Uh, last week, I was talking about how when I was on a Peloton, somebody looked at me and said, I'm proud of you and it was fake, but I want to look at you, all of you and say, I am proud of you. You somehow got here today on Marathon Sunday. That was a, a maze out, he, out there, and I am proud that you made it. There are a lot of new people here at Redeemer Lincoln Square. I want you to know, I want to reiterate this. If you are new and, and um, want to meet with any of the, of the pastoral staff, myself included, just reach out to the church, and we'll try to get coffee. We'll try to get meet up with you. We'd love to, to, to say hello and meet you. We did finish a series last week on Redeemer DNA, on the principles that this church is founded on. And I think I tried to say over and over and over again, principles are nice, but they're not great if you don't actually follow them. Like, they're just principles, they're just ideas and thoughts. And so we have to ask, are we going to live by them? What does it look like to live by them? Christians say that they live by grace, but what does a gracious life look like? What does it actually look like? And if I, could, if I could say it in one word, it's a generous spirit. And you're like, that's two words. All right. Um, it's generosity. And I need to make a confession here. I've never preached a, a, a multiple sermons on generosity because I've been afraid to at this church. I, I've been afraid to because I'm worried what my people think. Oh, no, he's going to start talking about generosity. He means he wants to talk about my money. He's going to talk about my stuff. And then this, your cynical heart gets moving, and I get cynical about your cynicism. And, and that's why I've actually never done it. I've never done it because I worry how you might interpret this conversation. But let me try to say something before you hear anything else. Let me say this. A life of generosity is so much bigger than possessions. It's so much bigger than that. And so before you hear anything else, you need to hear this, that I'm not going to make a case for why you need to give at Redeemer Lincoln Square only. I do think if this is your church, I think you should support a church. I think you should support this church if it's your church. I can get somebody to walk you through everything that we put our money towards to serve you and, and put this on, if you like. But that's not the point of what we're trying to do here. The point is this, we are doing you a disservice if we don't tease out the implications of what it looks like to actually live out these principles. And so if you can, and, I'm, and I'm, I guess I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to you, try to suspend that cynicism for just a moment of why we might be doing this. I know you're in the back of your head, you're thinking of how people have been abusive with, with uh, this conversation. You're thinking about how people can misuse this. But ask yourself, why might Jesus have talked about money and possessions and stuff more than love? What might he know about how we interact with our stuff that we might not know? 
as you look at our text, why does Paul highlight people in verse 4? Begging, it says. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege to give. Are we a church that is known to be begging to give or to talk about giving? I don't, I gotta be honest with you. Nobody's like, Michael, I wish you talked about giving more. Nobody does that. But I, why don't we? Why is that not part of our hearts? I've been wronged not, not talking about this. I've been afraid too long, for too long. But the truth is this. If Christianity is true, if it's really, really true, then it's going to manifest itself in a generous spirit. It has to. It has to overflow with a changed life. So let's look at three things today. We're going to look at the behavior of generosity. We're going to look at the power behind that behavior. And then we're going to look at the source of the power behind the behavior. I'll say it again. We're going to look at the behavior, the power, and the source of generosity. Now, first, the behavior. How do we motivate behavior? Let me tell you how we normally do it. If you walk out those doors, the way we normally get people to do anything, it's usually fear and pride, or command and guilt. Usually, people say, hey, you should give, or you must, like some sort of law. That's like, that, that's uh, the command. Guilt is this. Your inboxes are about to be inundated with people telling you about all the needs of sort of for the year-end giving of some organization. And they'll put up the need, they'll put up the pictures, they'll put up the stories, and the goal at the end of the day is to move you to do so. What's striking for me in today's text, Paul does neither one of those things. In fact, look at verse 8. He goes out of his way to say, I'm not commanding you. So whatever you hear about tonight, today, it is not a command. And he doesn't, by the way, he doesn't go to need either. He doesn't say, what he, this whole text is he's trying to raise funds for poor Christians in Jerusalem. He doesn't say, if you don't give, who knows what's going to happen to them. He doesn't do that. And so I think it's important for us to start with the fact that Paul doesn't do what normally everybody else does. Why? Because you can't legislate generosity. It's not generous if you're being told that you have to be generous. It can't be. Instead, what does Paul do? Is he lists behaviors of generosity. And I want to do the same thing at, at first. Let's go through them. Behavior number one, looking at our text, generosity is not dependent on good circumstances. Sometimes if you read this just for the first time, you think he's saying, be like the Macedonians. But that's actually not his goal. It's that there's a theological goal to highlight. Look, if you go to verse 2, people who, despite, look, look what it says. It says, severe trials and extreme poverty in verse 2. The reason why he highlights this is he wants to show you that it was in the adversity that they were able to give. Therefore, you cannot root behavior of generosity in the amount that you have. In fact, I think you can actually prove the other way around, that statistically speaking, you, the wealthier you are, the less you actually give proportionally. Uh, there, there's all kinds of statistics about this. The, the poorest state in our union in, in America, the one that has the worst standard of living, actually has the highest per capita giving. And the wealthiest states that, that have the, most, the highest standard of living actually give the lowest per capita giving. If you go to, and this is not just about America today, look at Christians over time in history that during the Great Depression, Christians actually gave a higher percentage of their overall uh, uh, you know, amount that they had compared to today. In the uh, Chronicle of, where is this? In the Chronicle of um, Philanthropy, um, this is a couple years ago, there was a, a study done asking people who had inherited wealth, what, and this is the question they asked, what amount of money would you need to feel totally secure? And to their surprise and shock, we know what they found? They found that it was always double of whatever they just inherited. So if you inherited $10,000, they said, you know what, I really, I really need, I need a 20. And they, they, they found people who inherited millions of dollars, they actually found it was about roughly double. And I think what Paul's trying to show us is, if you wait until you have enough, this is never going to happen. So therefore, that means, here's how we normally do things in our mind. We go, you know what, I don't have, I'm really busy, it's New York, I don't have enough time right now, but if one day I will. Or, you know, I don't have enough, you know, um, you know, resources, but I will one day. Maybe I will. And Paul's saying, no, that's not how it ever works. It shows you're either grossly unaware of what you actually have and or you're unaware of who you really are. So that's the first generous behavior is that, it can't, number one, it can't be based on, on what you have. Number two, look at what Paul says in verse two. 
generosity, when it's really generous, the behavior is that it comes with overflowing joy. And this is important. We, we talk in, at Lincoln Square a lot about joy, but in particular, this is overflowing joy. That real generosity comes with cheerfulness. We went trick-or-treating this past week with my kids um, and uh, in our building, and then we go outside as well. When, I've, when we've gone, I've often noticed that when you go to the homes, people come out with like a bowl, and they always say, take one. Take one. But I remember when I was trick-or-treating, the, the, the houses that, or, or apartments I loved going to were the ones where they would show up and they would look at you and say, don't you dare just take one. Take as much as you want. And so you just kind of double fist, put both hands in, and you walk around and you're, you look like this with this joy on your face and the glee in your, in your mind. And they're watching you and they're getting joy from your joy. Because that's how it always works. When you throw a surprise party for a friend, and you do all this work and all this effort, and it's hard, and you're doing all the planning, and then the day arrives, and you see the joy in their face. You get joy through their joy. It just sort of overflows. It, it comes out. Uh, when you give a standing ovation at a concert, you go to a concert, and, and you, you got the joy from uh, the art that you just saw, and you stand up, and you start clapping. What are you doing? You're responding to the joy that you got, and you're giving joy, and then they're getting joy from your joy, and it's going back and forth, back and forth. That's the nature that Paul roots real generosity in. It's a nature of cheerfulness that you can't fake. It's overflowing. It's overwhelming. It, just, it, it can't help but get out. Number two, joy. Third behavior. Look at verse 5. Uh, in verse 5 it says, They exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first all to the Lord— then to us. And this is an important uh, uh, progression that you see here. That in Paul's mind, giving yourself to God naturally leaves giving yourself to others. And it's not compartmentalized. It's not like over here in my little, my little part of my life. Over here, I'll give this part where I have uh, excess. No. In Paul's mind, it is the entirety of your life. Let's look at verse 1. The whole reason to bring this up. Brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace of God. We want you to get this grace. And this is an important thing. Giving without grace is a moralism. It's a, it's a, it's a I have to, not I want to. It's a, it's a, you should, or I feel guilty. But grace without giving, in Paul's mind, it's not real. There's no such thing as that. That's a, it's a fake to say there's grace without giving. He would say, no, then you didn't get any grace. No, in it always manifests in some way out of you. Here at Redeemer Lincoln Square, we like, to call, we like to talk about it as our time, our talents, and our treasures. These are the things that are given to you. Everybody in this room, in different proportions, have been given time to spend, right? There's 24 hours in a day, and you have to decide how you're going to use that time on friends, on people, on church, on volunteering, whatever. Time is an asset. Talents are your skills and your abilities that you use. And then treasure is not just money, it's, it's really anything that you possess and have that, that you wield. And I would argue in this room, some of you have more time than treasure, some of you have more treasure than time, and I think in, in your, if you want to just look at yourself in chapters of your life, that will change too. But whatever it is, what Paul is saying is the behaviors of generosity always, number one, not dependent on what you have, number two, cheerful and joyous and overflows, and number three, when it does come out, it's, it's, your, it's your full persona of time, talents, and treasures. There's behavior. All right, number one. Number two, what's the power behind it? Some of you are sitting here, and you're like, man, I did not ask for Michael to start talking about this. What, the, you're asking the so what question we talked about last week. You're sitting here going, why are we even talking about this? And I want to pause in the middle of the sermon to, to address you, whether you're a Christian or not, because the reason why we need to talk about this is because if you are asking that question, it means you really haven't teased out the implications of what an, living a life of ungenerosity, of an ungenerous heart is. I don't ha we don't have time as a whole separate sermon to talk about what it looks like when you, when you don't think this way, when you think, about inter when you think about pouring in and not out. But I think it comes down to what's the source, what's the power behind your behaviors. And for Paul, it's pretty simple. He roots it, look what he says. He roots it in verse 8, in the sincerity of your love. And I, I, we say this a lot here. When we use the word love in, in American English, love is this fuzzy-dovey word. But for Paul, 
Love is a, is a lot more rich and deep and natural. For him, love is something that you always do when you love something. You always do what you love, right? You always spend on what you love. You always talk about what you love. I'll give an example of this. Years ago, I had a friend uh, here in New York, and he loved bird watching. He loved birds. And we'd go to Central Park, and we'd go on walks, but he'd always come with his binoculars, and he would watch birds. And we'd be talking about something really interesting in my mind, because that's, that's what I love. And he'd be like, shh, shh, do you hear that? And some birds are chirping, and I'm like, yeah. I mean, he's like, no, it's this rare blah, 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 and he's going on and on and on about some colors and beaks and behaviors of birds. Why? Because he loved birds. He, he couldn't help but talk about them. He couldn't help but spend time on it. He actually had an app where he would record, which is really weird that he could do this. He could record the sound of the bird, and then he would go home and try to find the sound of that bird against all the other bird sounds that he had in that app. And he tried to match him, and he'd say, hey, remember that bird? You know, I found out what it was. It was this, this, and this. I don't even, I can't even, I don't even, I can't even give you one bird, a finch, a, a pigeon. That, that's, the, that's the bird I know in my head. That's, that, that's, that's the most reality and imagination I have for birds. Now, he had a much deeper vocabulary and understanding and ability because his whole imagination was infused with the love of bird watching. Bec and because he loved it, guess what? Everything else naturally flowed out. It, w it didn't seem costly to him to spend time on birds. It didn't seem costly to him to spend money on birds. And it didn't seem uh, hard to use his abilities and his talents to do bird watching. Why? Because it was a love. And here's what's cool about love. When it's a love, it naturally refills. Every time you spend it, it replenishes itself. It naturally just comes back up again because it re-ups, it retries it because your imagination is captured by it. And the question I want to ask you before we move on is, what's powering you? What's your love on right now? What behaviors do your loves push you out into doing? See, we, we're starting backwards. We start with the behaviors, and everybody always starts there and says, well, then I'll do this and try to manipulate that. I'm not doing that. I'm saying go to the source of the, go to the power behind it. And we need to ask ourselves, are we pouring into people because of our love for people? Are we pouring into uh, our neighbors because of our love for our neighbors? Are we curious about them? What makes them work? What makes them tick? What, who are they? And our friends in our church, out of love. There was a, an Atlantic article, uh, you can look it up, called The Secret to Love is Just Kindness. It's a long article, but it was actually an interesting article about social researchers that tried to get at the essence of healthy marriages. And I didn't know this, but I, some of you might know the, the statistic that about 50% of all American marriages end in divorce. Well, these researchers actually say that's, that's, that's not quite accurate as far as what's a healthy marriage, because if you add up everybody who's either divorced or separated or in an unhappy, bitty, bitter marriage, by their calculations, if you take all marriages ever, you have about only three in ten healthy marriages. So it's a very small percentage. And what they found is, through their research, that every day people in a marriage have an opportunity to either turn towards each other or turn away from each other. They called them bids, B-I-D-S, bids. And what they found is couples who were together after six years had a turn towards each other rate of 87%. And people who ended up divorcing had a turn o towards each other rate of only 33%. And because of their statistics, what they found is uh, with a 94% certainty, they were able to tell if you were going to stay in your marriage, if it was going to be a happy marriage or not. Because what they were able to find is the thing, the power moving you towards each other, to turn towards each other, to be generous towards each other, was always a love and a kindness of the other person. And when you didn't have that, it, when you turned away, it was because of coldness or contempt. And so what I, what I'm, I'm bringing this up to you because science is showing us and proving that it's always kindness and love that's behind the generosity that keeps us even together in our marriages. But Paul would say it's actually what's behind everything else. And now we're getting to why you actually need to know this. Now we're getting to why this is actually should matter to you. Because if this is not the power behind your behaviors, it's just not going to happen. It's when we feel loved, flooded with undeserved 
cosmic love, it's, that's when we delight in other people. And it's what drives generosity and everything else. The sheer wonder of the love of power for everything and everyone else. All right, last point. Fine. That's the power behind the behavior, but what's the source behind the power behind the behavior? Because, and I think Paul anticipates this question. In fact, I got this point because I'm, I'm reading his own progression. When in verse 8, he tells us what the love is, he now realizes he has to get to the source. So he goes, to look at verse 9, the very next verse, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. You want to know how Paul motivated husbands to love their, their wives in Ephesians 5? He didn't say, you better. He didn't say, or if you don't, it's going to break up. No, you know what he does? He says, love your spouse, be committed to them as Christ loved the church by dying for her. He always goes to Jesus, and he does the same thing here. He says that if you knew how rich he was cosmically, if you knew how much he had in the Trinity, perfect love, perfect relationship, perfect everything, he had the perfect world that you and I always have desired, and yet it says he became poor, not physical poverty only. People always focus on Jesus. You know, when he died, the only thing he had was his possessions on, the, on you know, his own clothes and sandals, or that he was born in a manger, or that he was a carpenter. But that's not the full brunt of the debt that he incurred of humanity, that all of our misplaced loves, all the ways that we don't live lives the way that we should, we don't give as we should, we don't care as we should. Jesus died to take that penalty of sin so that now when we accept him as our Savior, we get rich. And some of the people, there are some prosperity gospel folks that think they try to twist that into riches physically, but that's not what Paul does here. The riches that you get, the wealth that you have, is, not, is, is, is this. It means being able to have nothing materially, but having everything cosmically. Where, here, how, look how rich this could be. You could be utterly physically alone, but never actually cosmically alone. Do you know how much that's worth? Do you know how amazing that is? How much is it worth that you can go to a perfect and good God anytime you want? I've been trying to recently in my prayer life, begin my prayer life by saying, I'm just so thankful that I can even do this. Because there's a, there's a, for some of us, there's this idea that we should be able to go to God anytime we want. On what, uh, on what grounds? It's amazing that we have that kind of access to a perfect and infinite God anytime you want, and you can't put a price on that. And so, and here's what happens if you, if you realize this. When we realize this, when we recognize that your cosmic wealth, the jewels of Jesus, the crown of his love, the, the rings of access that you can put on your fingers to get to God— when you realize that you have that, you're going to, I promise you, you're going to look at your time, you're going to look at your talents, you're going to look at your treasures in a completely different way. How so? When you realize that your life right now, the 80 to 100 years, depending on if you're lucky, that you live right now, when you realize that's only a fraction of the infinity of time and spaces you're going to have with him, guess what? You're just not going to care about that jacket as much as you thought. You're not going to need Netflix, as much as you thought you needed it. You're, you're going you're to approach your, your time, you're going to approach your stuff, you're going to approach even your abilities differently. Because you're, you're going to use them differently because your calculus has changed because what you value changes. Right? Think about it. If your creature comforts no longer are the most highest prize that you're going to, you know, go after, which, by the way, is what the world will tell you that you need to have a good life. But if that no longer is what you need— and, then, and the highest good out there, what's the highest good? Other people, the kingdom of God, getting close to his love, getting other people close to his love. If that's true, you're going to spend on that. It's going to change everything. In other words, we're simply not going to buy or spend as much on one thing. That's not going to last. Now, before we end, I want to answer a question I think is in the back of your mind, which is this. This is all nice, Mike. Thank you so much. But how do I get over the fear that I live daily, maybe hourly, of not having enough. And I'm just going to put myself in the same boat with you. Is that this is all nice, theoretical, thank you so much. But the way I, I walk out those doors is I'm like, I need, I want, I have to have, I have to get. If I just get this, then I will. How do you get over that? And in Paul's mind, going back to that verse 9, 
you have to see him as your inheritance. You have to see him as the one that you get to have. Um, I don't know how many of you have done those trust falls. Have you been to those like corporate meetings where they, they make you like put your arms like this and then you're supposed to fall back? I don't know if they do them anymore because there's probably all these, you know, uh, I bet you people purposely fall this way and then they get um, disability, you know, so don't, you know. Um, not that I thought about that. Um, but in those trust falls, you know what always happens? You're always like, you're thinking, don't, don't you dare. You, you better not drop me. There's part of us that asks the same thing about God. How do I know he's not going to drop me? How do I know? And the only answer I can come up with is that you're too precious to him to let you drop. Have you ever held something super precious? When I was doing my, my PhD, I actually held a sermon from the 1740s, and it was so frail. I remember holding it like this, like, I, I was trying not to breathe on it because I didn't want to blow it off or let it fall. And I, I walked around like this because <laughs> it's so precious. That's how you hold precious things. What this is telling us is that you are that precious to him. He's not going to let you fall. If he spent 2,000 years ago everything to acquire you, is he going to let you fall today? Is he, is he going to let you get away today? No way. He can't and he won't because you're too precious to him. And so if Jesus was willing to lose his life for you, if God was willing to lose his son for you, we can be willing to lose X, Y, Z for him and for others. Maybe not, I mean, I've got to be honest, you might not, if this is true, if you start living this out, you might not have as much physical stuff, as much time, as much comfort as you had before, but you will have enough because generosity is an act of joy that comes out of the heart. And that joy comes by seeing him, and it just flows out. And if that's true, grace means if Jesus gave everything for me, then I can give myself for others. And you know what that would look like? I, I, I can't—it's so hard to explain it to you all. It's joy, it's contentment, it's settledness, it's, it's uh, peace, it's, thank, it's, it's a space of thanksgiving. To end, let me just give you a couple things practically that you can do to know if you have this generosity. Number one, uh, uh, two things. Number one— a heart of generosity is, becomes foundational. What I mean by foundational, it always becomes, this is the basis by which you live and view everything else. You know, what, every, you, know you put on glasses like these, you see everything else through it. If, that, if this is foundational, you see all of life through it, that means you can sit with God and you can ask him for courage about how to spend your time. Here's something crazy. What, how crazy would it be if instead of rushing out of here, you go, you know what, I'm going to turn to the person next to me and, and find out more about them. If you could have the courage because you know what, it's a cost to do that. Or what about giving, you know, of your, your talents and your treasures? In the Old Testament, New Testament, there was this 10% tithe where they roughly gave about 10% of all that they had. You, you can ask Jesus for the courage to do that, because if you did, it would mean you wouldn't have as much stuff to go on vacation with, or as much stuff to uh, give to, uh, you know, give to yourself. You wouldn't be able to do as much. But then we're free to look around to those who need generosity, and we can give it to them. Last implication, last practical application. When was the last time you asked yourself and assessed your own generosity? I, I like to be as practical. I'm trying to make it as practical as possible. When was the last time you asked yourself, what's my larger vision mission? I'm, I, I was, I'm reading this book uh, about New York and the foundings of, of New York. New York was founded by the Dutch to make a buck. That's the, why this city started, and why a lot of people come here, and a lot of people stay here when they grow up here. But that shouldn't be the reason why you are here. We should be here for, for more than that. Redeemer Lincoln Square's vision is to joyfully live as reflections of God's love together in the city. That's what we're trying to do here, and you should ask yourself, is that your vision? And if it's not, what is? Right, that's what we need to ask ourselves, to live joy generously. And I, I can say this to your face with all seriousness, Jesus doesn't care what you're, give, what you're giving. He doesn't even care how, nor do I. What, he ma what matters more is the manner by which you do it. It's, is, it is, a joy over, is a joy overflowing. The conviction I've had this whole week for myself is I found a proportional percentage. The more that I give as much as I have joy of. Uh, the convicting thing for me is that 
the amount I give is always tied to the exact amount of joy and grace. And again, amount, don't think just possession. I'm thinking time, talents, and treasures. And it needs to move itself out. And so the last thing I want to say is this. Please don't hear Paul saying, you have to. Please don't say, hear him say, this is a command. It's not. That's impossible. And so if you find right now you have a, this, this is a struggle for you, that you don't have a joy in giving, in generosity, I'd love for you to start there. Start with sitting in his promises. Start in sitting in his grace more. Let them wash over you. Taste and see and sit. Knowing that in, until you can say, Jesus, I now know you will never, ever, 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 ever forsake me. Until you can do that, you're not going to be able to have any of the other generosity traits and behaviors to change in your life. So let me, let me end with one of my favorite stories I've told before. Um, it's from a famous sailor who, in the 1700s, he, it was a very lucrative job to do transatlantic voyages. And uh, he, was, he was stopping this. He made enough money. He was going to settle down in America with his fiancée. So he had one last voyage with her over to America. And yet, on this particular voyage, they hit a huge storm. And when I say storm, I'm talking... Uh, you know, house-sized waves crashing, lightning, wind, everything bad going on. And he was a sailor, and this was normal for him, but his fiance was like, we're over. This is over. We're all going to die. And to try to encourage her, he said to her, he said, listen, don't worry. God's going to see us through. And she said, how do you know? How do you know that he will? And in a, in a moment of inspiration, he pulls out his sword and he points it to her. And I've been thinking about this. That's probably really risky to do if everything's like falling out around and the boat's moving around. But apparently, he pointed the sword to her and said, are you scared? And she said, no. And he goes, why not? He said, because I, she, she said, because I know the, hand, the, the heart behind the hand of that sword. And he said, that's the same with God. You know the heart behind his hand, that he is never going to let you go. And we, because we know that heart, and Jesus shows us that generous heart, we can trust him. Out of that trust comes this generosity and all the implications from it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a hard topic for me. I, I, maybe it's because I grew up in this town. Maybe it's because of uh, how I see my own possessions. I, and that word right there, my own, mine. Father, just um, give us grace in this space. Help us to see a larger vision you're pushing us towards. Beyond ourselves, beyond the physical material to the spiritual Father. Ask ourselves, I pray that everybody in this room does a, an assessment for themselves. Like, what are we trying to live out? What do we really believe? And I'm, at, I'm saying this for whether there's Christians in this room, non-Christians, or everybody in between who doesn't know what they believe yet. Help us to really be thoughtful about what we believe, Father. Help us to see our generosity comes out in profound ways when we see your generosity first. Help us to see it towards us, the riches we're lavished with, and let it be profound out in the world. We pray these things in your name. Amen.